the struggle for health, a landmark book on health under development and activism, first published by David Sanders and Richard Kever in 1985. Recently, we've just seen the second edition of The Struggle for Health. When it first appeared, The Struggle for Health became the go-to text for those who wanted to know more about the politics dimension of health and how it caused ill health, especially in the global South. In many ways, the second edition picks up on where the first edition leaves us. It continues the story of how corporate sector shapes the health, how corporate sector shapes our health through hijacking food system, research and development of how new medicine, uh, sorry, research and development of new medicines and the delaying of meaningful, meaningful action to the climate crisis. So today we are here with Wim, one of the co-editors of the new edition for the struggle for the health. He is also an activist for the People's Health Movement to discuss the publication of the book and its relevance on the ongoing health struggles. Welcome, Wim. Hello, thank you, uh, Tinashe. David Sanders influenced the movement for the right to health in many levels. The struggle for the health was one of the channels that he managed to do through. But, it, but this was a particular important channel, reaching many activists and health workers who were wondering about their role in shaping the health system and in making the struggle for health a proper political struggle. In any way, Wim, did the book play a role in your formation as a health activist in some way? Uh, yes, yes, thank you for the question. Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it's the case for many, many others as well, other people who have read it at that time. Actually, in the 1990s, I was uh, working as a development worker in the Philippines. So I was uh, a member of the target audience because David, uh, when he wrote it, he really had that kind of people in mind. And um, I, I must say, actually, I, I had read already quite uh, uh, some other materials, some other books on political economy, on, on public health. But the struggle for health was unique because it brought together um, everything in one, one analysis. And, and it also added, uh, apart from analysis of political economy and public health, it added for me um a theory of change mm. uh it 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 showed the perspective of of change that was really uh revolutionary uh mm. both figuratively and literally uh, and and something that was also very important for me uh in my formation that it also added a class perspective because mm. i was um a graduate medical school um, mm. and it is through the book through the struggle for health that I understood how uh, my world outlook the way I looked at the world and I understood um, how society was functioning how the role played by uh, medicine and and um, mm. uh, healthcare how that mm. was shaped by um the ruling classes actually huh? and it's when i understood that working with farmers and workers in the philippines that i learned so much more about about um about health and and um so that's that was something something very new for me and that really changed the way i looked at the role of health workers um, and health professionals, and uh, that was something very particular about um, about uh, the, the effect that uh, the struggle for health had on me at that time. I think mm -hmm. because David also used a lot of um, examples from his work in, in Zimbabwe and, and Southern Africa, I, I can imagine, Tinashe, that, that it was also very important in shaping the health movement in Southern Africa. I would be interested yes. to, to hear something about that, actually. 
it's, it's, it's quite important the role that David, the legacy that he left, which is still living, you know, uh, the fact that he, 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 he is worked tight on the lowest, on the grassroots, people who are right on the grassroots, people who are in the middle kind of a level, and those who are the, 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 the important decision makers. So he, his work was quite important in the fact that it was a cut crossing kind of work that speak that that speak volumes to all those levels from 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 from, from, from the community health care worker to from, I mean not even from the community health worker from a parent himself from a parent him or yourself community health care worker a doctor a nurse a student and influencing also the political um uh, I mean the, the political heads the police makers. So, uh, uh, Wim, quickly, just tell me, with the subtitles of of the struggle for health, uh, struggle for the struggle for the health, remaining medicine and and politics of the underdevelopment. But we know very well that the world has gone through many changes since 1985. While we were working on this new edition. How did you see the underdevelopment change over these decades? Also, and tell me, how do you find David's perspective from the first edition uh, fitting into the into this uh, change landscape of uh, many many years that we since we have seen the first edition? Yeah, it was 1985, so indeed it's, uh, it's almost uh, uh, 40 years. Um, yes. And and it has been we've been discussing a lot with David uh, when when we started the project, and that was one of his questions also. Is it still relevant this book? Huh? Is it is this analysis still relevant? He, he asked me over and over again, and we discussed that um, for hours actually. Uh, even even the terminology is it still relevant? To talk about underdevelopment, or has it ever been relevant to consider some countries uh, developed and others underdeveloped? Of course, it's not. Of course, we know by now that this um, this terminology is not not very appropriate. But we 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 decided to use it anyway, and we we explain in the book why it's just pragmatic because uh, whatever terminology you use, it's always descriptive. Uh, we don't talk about the third world anymore. Uh, we can talk about the global north, the global south, or, or use other euphemisms. But uh, mm -hmm. actually, as long as people know, we were very pragmatic. As long as people know what we're talking about, uh, we can still use uh, development and underdevelopment as, as terminology. Mm -hmm. And, and um, what changed? Actually, we only had to add uh, one uh, one chapter to the book. Uh, so we used the exact mm. the very same uh, outline with the, the same mm. chapters, but we decided to add just one chapter, and that is um, a chapter on health policies um, mm. under uh, neoliberal globalization. So, and and in that chapter. We describe how uh, things evolved since the 1980s, um, how the, the especially in, in the global health. Uh, David, for example, in 1985, he talked about about uh, Alma Ata, of course, about the uh, primary healthcare movement, uh, community health workers, uh, and how important um, that was to to change uh, medicine and change society. But um, we had to describe how this whole um, uh, primary healthcare movement evolved towards more selective uh, interventions. Mm -hmm. uh, we also had to describe how the, the whole aid industry and the, the philanthro capitalists uh, were capturing uh, this global health uh, scene. Um, mm. But at the, at the other hand, we also, in the same chapter, we also talk about uh, the renewed um, attention for for health as a as a human right, and also mm. how in the in the two thousands, since the year two thousand, um, 
the people's health movement uh, grow as a movement, uh, a, a worldwide, a global movement uh, for health rights. So I think that that's the, the, the main trends uh, we had to describe uh, since 1985. But we also concluded that essentially the mechanisms of underdevelopment, uh, the mechanisms of, of exploitation and, and global power politics uh, between the industrialized countries and what we uh, call the, the, the underdeveloped world, the third world, uh, the global south, how these mechanisms uh, actually didn't change, didn't change at all. We're still talking mm. about, um, about a world that is divided between, um, between the centers of capitalism and, um, and, and an, an exploited uh, world uh, that we refer to as global south. The, the, the pandemic itself has highlighted some injustice uh, that we have we we have we have all uh, have seen, and also it is also exposed how weak, especially in the global south, our health system is. What do you think could be some of the David Sanders' thoughts if he was to be present during the COVID nineteen pandemic? Unfortunately, David passed away in two thousand nineteen, and that was just a few months. Uh, yeah. Before the, uh, the the COVID pandemic the, um, broke out, and and and, and um, so many times, actually, we asked ourselves that question: uh, How would he um, how would he analyze? But uh, actually, he would have analyzed it just like he analyzed the the AIDS uh, epidemic, and you know very well, probably. Uh, how he was able uh, to describe the social and uh, social and economic uh, drivers of the pandemic. He was able to explain that the pandemic was fueled not just by a virus, uh, but by the social and economic injustices and and the the power relations. Uh, within society that was the real driver behind the AIDS uh, epidemic at that time that's how we explained it so I think he would also have been the first one in uh, January 2020 uh, to analyze the COVID pandemic as uh, actually an, 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 a pandemic of, uh, of global um, injustice. We know how useful was the first edition uh, I mean, everyone adopted it as a sort of a field and research work guide among health workers, among, among health activists and academics uh, all over the world. How do you anticipate, how do you think the, the, the second edition will, will be used? Well, that's of course hard to say because there's, there's, there's many other books today about, about global health, about um, about social determinants of health. I think there's much more uh, material available, huh? but um, the, the new book, The Struggle for Health, uh, second edition, is available open access uh, online. So everyone uh, can read it for free, uh, can download it, um, can use the illustrations. Uh, and that's, that, makes it, that makes it extra exciting, of course. That makes it very exciting because it becomes very uh, accessible. Uh, and it's available for everyone with an internet connection. Um, today, um, as I said, a difference with 1985, today we have a global movement. We have the People's Health Movement. We have a global movement for health rights, um, for, for the right to health. Uh, and I hope that many of those activists, uh, if they have an internet connection, um, are able to access it and, and use it also in their... Uh, activist work. So in that sense, I don't think it will make a big difference. I've heard uh, anecdotes about, about uh, the first edition being Xeroxed and then Xerox copies being used uh, by, by um, um, medical uh, students 
or uh, health activists in poor countries. Uh, today, we can just uh, download it. So I think it will be as useful as the first edition. And uh, mm. we invite, uh, that's how we end the book as well. Uh, we invite um, everyone uh, to join the struggle for health. And we hope that just like the struggle for health was David Sanders' life, uh, we also hope uh, that it may become the life of many more people, actually. So it's mm. only if we struggle together collectively uh, for health that it can become a reality. Thank you so much, Wim. I mean, thank you so much for re evoking the spirit of uh, Comrade David Sanders. Uh, in South Africa, we say, Amantla, long live the spirit of Comrade David, long live. Uh, and congratulations on such a uh, successful uh, project. And we hope that it's going to inspire and touch a lot of young activists, both in the global, in the, in, in, in global north and global south. Thank you so much. Thank you, Amantla Aweto. Me too. <laughs> <laughs>